Lara Dimitrova Stoimanova, Sarah Long, Max von Thun. Welcome to Digital Markets Research Hub. We will be discussing today a, a new legislation which has finally been adopted and received royal assent, the UK Digital Markets Competition and Consumers Act. Uh, the, the, we, we had several occasions to discuss this uh, bill and obviously comparing it with the Digital Markets Act. But now we have the first opportunity to look at the final document. And uh, according to the to the legislation itself, the the Competition and Markets Authority is required to to consult on the guide on the guidance uh, on how it will be enforcing this this new legislation. So I hope we'll have chance to look at this document as well. So many interesting issues to address. So I wanted to propose maybe we can start with offering our what I call normative disclaimers, in a sense, showing what 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 do we expect from the from the new legislation and through which lenses we we look at it. Maybe let us start. Let us start with you, Lar. Thank you, Oles. Of course, I mean I am delighted that uh, the bill is finally here. It has been a long time in the making, so it's I'm glad that it's here. And personally, what I'm looking for is I'm very much hoping the bill will introduce the very much required contestability and level playing field in digital markets and also ensure that investments and innovation are basically not concentrated in the hands of a few big players, but everybody else has the opportunity to actually contribute into the digital markets. The one um, proviso for me is to make sure that the decision makers act boldly and swiftly, and they are also clear about their expectations of market outcomes when designing their remedies. Hopefully we'll touch on that point a little bit later, but I personally do not like remedies like brand, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory, because they beg the question, things like, what is fair? What is reasonable? So I'll stop there and hand over to the other speakers as well. But at a very high level, I'm very much excited about this legislation. Thank you very much, Lara. Sarah? Also excited. Um, we, we were just saying that I think for those of us who work in digital markets, we have been sort of waiting for this, a bit like my six-year-old waits for Christmas with anticipation mm -hmm. and excitement. So um, in full transparency, I think we're probably all still, we've had an opportunity to read lots, but I think everyone will still be fighting through all of the substance over the next sort of few months. I think just as a high level, you know, we're looking here in terms of the UK at a targeted regime that focuses on the particular harm that manifests in digital markets and can't be dealt with effectively under the current regime. So I think one of the things that is really important is the ability for the CMA to intervene to prevent competitive harm and, for example, foreclosure of new entrants where the market structure may not be obvious. And I think one of the things, just from a practical perspective, is that if you look at some of these markets, there's a really complicated web of vertical and horizontal agreements to understand. And that means you can't always put them in a clear box of this is a horizontal agreement, this is a vertical agreement, we assess it in a particular way. You need to be much more flexible in your legal assessment. And that is something that we, we need to see from the CMA so that they can really understand how these markets work and actually where the relationships are between the different entities to ensure that those new entrants and the, the potential competition that we need to see is able to flourish. I think the slight unknown is how will this regime sit alongside the DMA, particularly when they are they are ultimately different regimes with slightly different aims, processes and outcomes, but they are targeting the same companies. So I think that is something that will be um, of relevance as, you know, those of us that advise companies that operate sort of globally, um, they will have an interest in making sure that remedies in the UK, and we'll get to remedies later, you know, are not inconsistent, of course, with anything that's happening um, outside of the UK. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Max? So I'll echo a lot of what uh, Sarah and Lara were saying. I mean, I'm very happy the legislation is is here. I think it was very uh, necessary. I think we needed to expand the toolkit after the you know experience we've had of using the the traditional antitrust powers in digital markets. Um, and you know, I think a kind of ex ante regime like this was the way to go. 
Uh, and I think, you know, for all of us who've been working on it recently, it was easy to take its existence for granted, but I think it is a big achievement. Uh, and I think, you know, at the beginning of the process, when, when these kinds of changes were being suggested by various people, including Furman Review and so on, I think they, they sounded quite, quite radical and ambitious. So I think, uh, you know, it's just great to finally have this uh, on the book, so to speak. Um, I really like the flexibility of the legislation. I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit later. But if you compare it to the DMA, for example, I think... Uh, this gives the CMA more and more discretion to use its powers in a more kind of imaginative and ambitious way. Um, and I think in terms of what I'm hoping for, um, I would like the powers to be used in a way that I think really, you know, to go to Lara, um, Lara's point about contestability, that really injects competition in digital markets. So we're not just focusing on uh, trying to stamp out some of the, let's say, anti-competitive practices, bad behavior we've seen in the past. I think that's important, but I think we should also think about how we can not just kind of uh, prevent this kind of conduct, but also open up these markets. Um, I, I think it's also good if we try and focus on emerging harms as well as the harms that we're familiar with. So, you know, for example, generative AI, how can, how can we prevent the market from tipping in favor of a few giants um, and so mm -hmm. on? Um, and I think also just to, to Sarah's point, I think the interaction with the DMA will be very interesting. And what I'm hoping for is that we see a kind of you know, I think we all agree competition is a good thing. And I think competition between regulators is also a good thing. So I'm hoping that the kind of ex the parallel enforcement processes of the CMA and the commission kind of lead to better outcomes in both. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Max. And as, as, a, as, a, as a follow up question, uh, Lara, in your recent um, podcast with Ronan Skankan, you mentioned, among other interesting things, that the, the lack of clear, clear goals of the, of the DMA and DMCCA is a kind of a, a problem. What, what precisely or what, what do we mean? So I wanted maybe to ask you quickly, do you think it's, it's, it's a bug or a feature that the, the goals are rather open ended, uh, allowing the enforcer to, to inject the, con the, the substance of, of these specific goals depending on the situation, or we would rather benefit from having a more clearly articulated, more, more narrower defined goals? Uh, yes, I think it's very important to have in mind uh, what the decision makers, whether it's European Commission or the CMA, have in mind. What do they want to achieve through the regulation? Because without a clear goal, it's very difficult to pen the way, but also in, in implement the right remedies. So what good looks like is very, very important because that will determine basically their approach. There are major differences in the way in which the DMA and the DMCC will work in practice. I mean, if you look at the Digital Markets Act, it's very it's a very long list of do's and don'ts. It's very prescriptive, which is good because it's clear and it gives uh, clear signals to, to the operators of what they need to do and not do. On the other hand, the DMCC gives the CMA more power, but also more ability to uh, have a flexible approach, which is great because it means the CMA will be able to tailor the remedies to the issues under consideration. But at the same time, it, it gives less clarity to the players in the sector. So we will have to see which approach will work better, but I can see pros and cons actually to either approach. I personally like the kind of um, the DMCC approach, partly because I, as a, as a regulator, I am kind of used to working within those kind of bounds. You know, the DMCC feels much more like a traditional piece of regulation of do's and don'ts, which in a fast moving technological market where, where things will change, it's a question mark whether it will work. But the one thing I want to say is um, from my perspective, I think, whether it's the DMA or the MTC, this is an accent regulatory framework which requires decision makers in competition policy environments to change their mindset and their culture. Because as a regulator, what you need to know is to understand the firms you regulate and the products you regulate. So that is a different way of working. It's a continuous relationship with the players in the sector, whether they are the big incumbents or the new entrants as opposed to a competition authority coming in once, boom, doing something and then coming out again. So the interesting thing is 
will either the CMA or the European Commission achieve that shift in mindset and culture in the way in which they have to deal with the sectors they are regulating? M M many thanks, Lara. And I will revert to this issue, asking you all about this new modality, more kind of regulatory dialogue or, or participatory approach uh, later in the conversation. Uh, Sara, what, what do you think about this, the, 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 the clarity of the goals? Is it the back of a feature? Well, I think we have to remember that the UK regime has always been designed to be flexible, bespoke and targeted. And I think the real difference for me is the the participative approach. And that is both from the SMS firms themselves, but also interested stakeholders and third parties. We'll talk about consultations a bit later. And <clears throat> now we've got the sort of meat on the bones through the CMA guidance, we can see the, the real extent of the CMA's discretion and the ability to adapt, change, flex how it does things. I mean, if you when you look at the language, um, it's sort of extraordinary, really, to sort of say, well, we may do this, but actually we may completely change our mind in relation to certain events. And look, to be blunt, this is quite challenging for a practitioner. <laughs> I think, you know, we are going to have to have some difficult conversations with our clients to say, OK, well, we know that the CMA took this approach in relation to this SMS designation in relation to this market. That does not mean they will take the same approach in this market, which is similar, but not the same or even the same market. But that has been absolutely fundamental in the way the CMA has wanted to give it the ability to um, adapt quickly to a completely different environment because there's suddenly a new way of doing business, because there's a new entrant, because there's a new entirely new market. So kind of a quid pro quo. I think the other point is that there has been some criticism around with, with the kind of consultations and the monitoring which is important to ensure public engagement, that this would mean that there's a slower process. But actually, a couple of points to make there, you know, there are statutory deadlines which are designed to ensure the process doesn't stall kind of too much. But then there's also <clears throat> a little nugget, for example. So if you look at Section 24.3 of the Act, that confirms that the CMA can carry out a consultation on a proposed conduct requirement at the same time as it carries out a consultation in relation to a proposed SMS designation. Now, you would expect these two processes to run sequentially rather than in parallel, but it makes it possible for the CMA to then impose the CRs at the same time they're issuing an SMS designation decision or sort of shortly afterwards. So <clears throat> there is this sort of, frankly, have your cake and eat it too <laughs> approach, which is, look, we want to have this ability to engage. We want to have this ability to be... Um, frankly, present in the market and understand how things are working. But then we've also got this ability to kind of speed things up so that there's no criticism that this is just going to take months and months and months. Many, many thanks, Sarah. Max, what is your vision about this? Open-endedness. Um, so I'm a little bit less concerned about the fact that the legislation specifically doesn't set out, you know, clear normative objectives, I think. Uh, I think it's good that the CMA has flexibility. And I think overall, if you look at uh, the overall, all the kind of different, let's say, communication that the CMA has been putting out, various strategy documents, the speeches they've been making, uh, I, I think there is still a pretty, pretty clear vision of how they want to use these powers, um, you know, to basically rein in the big tech firms and, and try and introduce more competition in digital markets, which I think is very similar to the contestability and fairness objectives in the DMA, for example. Um and then, I, but I, but I think more more specifically, uh, you know, I agree with Lara that I, I I think the flexibility in this regime is preferable to the approach of the DMA, which kind of lays out very exhaustively, uh, for example, what the obligations are for the gatekeepers and what the specific core platform services that are captured are. I think having this more open ended approach, where you know, for example, the CMA can designate any kind of digital activity and design obligations uh, in a kind of bespoke way, I think is a lot more future proof. Um, and I think if you just look at how different each of these companies' business models are and even how different their different services are within their ecosystems, I think trying to write a set of rules that was going to apply kind of in the long term without tweaking was was a little bit naive. And I think you're already seeing issues with that with the DMA. People are already saying, oh, well, how does you know this obligation apply to foundation models or, or well, which aren't even in part of the DMA or why isn't cloud, cloud computing in here? Uh, you know, and then there, there are certain issues there with the quantitative thresholds of the DMA, for example. So I think 
this approach overall will 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 allow will allow the CMA to do more without having to kind of revisit the rules. Um, or less. I mean, your question was about objective. May I make one observation, very brief one? Although the bill doesn't set out what the CMA's objective within the context of this regulation are, at a high level, obviously, the CMA's uh, duty is to promote competition, but it also has secondary duties around encouraging growth in the UK economy, et cetera, et cetera. So when you take the CMA's overall objectives into account, I think it will have a challenging job in trying to balance out its role in uh, supporting and uh, encouraging competition versus encouraging growth, because you can see different firms with different incentives playing to the different duties that the CMA has. Indeed. So, which makes it even more exciting to see which which narrative will prevail in inverse circumstances, why, and supported by 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 whom, by which stakeholder in this in this regulatory uh, game. Uh, the last kind of historiographical question, if I may, what do you think about uh, observing the, the legislative process, the, the mechanics of, of, of legislation uh, in the EU and in the UK? Do you have any uh, observations or reflections about which model uh, allows for a more participatory approach from, from those who want to contribute incrementally, uh, commenting on specific provisions of the DMA and the MCCA? Uh, or maybe there are some issues which we have to learn from each other, and I imagine it's very difficult to incorporate, but at least to be mindful of advantages and shortcomings of, of EU and UK legislative uh, process. Lara, let's start with you again. Uh, yeah, I just have very a small observation on the legislative process itself. I mean, it goes without saying that the process has taken longer in the UK than it did in the EC, but I don't think that was due to legislative process itself is the fact that unfortunately we had in the UK some big issues to deal with, such as Brexit, such as pandemic, and it always went to the end of a very long list of things to do for, for the ministers, so it took much longer. Now, if you look, we've already touched on this, the model will be more, it feels more participative in the UK, but it was it's set up to be more adversarial and potentially more political in the EU, which, which is always a little bit dangerous because it takes transparency away from it. But I'll leave my other two panelists to comment in more detail on the jurisdictional issues. Thank you very much, Lara. Sarah, what, what are your views? Um, well, I'd say that rarely in the UK do we welcome yet another general election but actually if it got us the act sort of through a bit quicker I think there are a sense of certain people saying okay well that's one positive because there, there has been some frustrations I would say it's you know it's well established that have been certain issues that have sort of stuck um just as sort of a random example I know we're going to talk about consumer but I think secondary ticketing for example which is not a core focus of of the, the the regime but that then could have there was a sort of fight between the house floors and house commons and how secondary ticketing was going to be dealt with and i use that just as an example of that is one tiny part of a massive act and this the fact that it was these sorts of sticky issues were holding things up i think was frankly of great frustration to many people who just really wanted to see this regime up and running so you know, we do now have it, and I think that's um, that's very welcome. I, I just 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 on sort of um, the sort of third party engagement. I think just one point to make, which I think is quite interesting, because if you look at some of the discussions around whether there should be third party engagement or the participative approach, my understanding, I obviously I followed the DMA slightly less closely than I have been following every inch of the the DMCCA. But in terms of, sort of third party engagement, that I understand that there really there was a dis quite a detailed discussion sort of within that legislative process around the extent to which third parties should be involved in the DMA. And there was a real sense that that would slow things down. And that if you had all these kind of compulsory points at which there was consultation, that that would um, that would result in the, the purpose of the regime, i.e. to move fast being impeded. What I think is so interesting, if you compare the two regimes, then we have the situation where we have the DMA, which has frankly limited 
parties there are points at which third parties can engage but there's i think there's been a letter that's going out sort of saying look it's just not enough but then you've got this relatively static regime which actually possibly can't allow for the fact that there'll be new developments and then in the uk you have a situation where there's huge amounts of continual consultation and engagement but actually a bit more flexibility to allow for um enforcement in areas that aren't set out so you actually if you look at it have two very different approaches and so it will be very interesting to see not, not quite who wins but really the outcome of those discussions <clears> where <throat> there was a sense in the uk we must allow for these sorts of third party engagements because that's really important to make sure that things are done correctly and that we understand how the markets are working at that particular point in time versus the somewhat more static dma we cannot have third parties because that slows everything down thank you very much sarah max you, you, you represent Open Markets Institute, quite a heavyweight uh, uh, civil society organization with, with significant visibility and impact, and you have been contributing to the DMA and DMCCA. So what are your views about how, how much of what you've been saying has been heard by, by the stakeholders in the EU and the UK? Yeah, I mean, let me, I'll, I'll go back to your question before first which was about the, the legislative process and comparing those two because uh, yeah we, we were engaged with with both of them um and following both very closely so so i have a few reflections on that first um you know as as laura said it did it did take longer to get the bill over the line in the uk but that wasn't actually because of the legislative process itself once it was in parliament it was it was basically the government sitting on it for for eight forever essentially uh and i think that really came down to I think a kind of discomfort in the conservative government well, sort of members of the conservative government about this legislation, you know, people like Jacob Rees-Mogg and, and others when he was in government, I think saw it as overly interventionist uh, and kind of government trying to, to interfere too much in digital markets. And so I think for, for those reasons, it kind of sat uh, within government instead of being published for, for a long time. I think if that hadn't been the case, actually probably would have passed before the DMA um, because you had the Furman Review in 2019. And, and I think these ideas were being developed earlier in the UK in general than they were in, in Brussels. Mm -hmm. um, but then on the legislative process itself, uh, I would say actually... I feel that the European process was a lot more democratic. Um, and I think the parliament was able to change the legislation a lot more in the EU than it was in the UK. I think the key reason for that is basically structural. And it's the fact that when well, the UK, when the, gov the government has an inbuilt majority, uh, and so essentially it's very hard for any opposition to make changes to the legislation, uh, the government, MP uh, government MPs vote according to the whip with the government, so they won't vote for amendments that are coming from the opposition. So it's very hard to get any kind of substantial changes made through to the legislation. Uh, and that was why the, ch the real changes you were seeing were coming from the government. Um, and that was mostly because of uh you know lobbying from from the companies themselves the sms firms uh, and that's why most of the changes i would say were kind of in a way watering down or or, or kind of adding new procedural hurdles hurdles to the legislation whereas if you look at what happened in brussels the dma was changed you know quite quite radically by the meps themselves uh from 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 all sorts of different parties uh and there you saw big changes like uh, an expansion in the list of services that are covered by the dma the sanctions were changed quite significantly. You know, they doubled the uh, percentage of turnover that companies can be fined. Um, as Sarah mentioned, there were kind of new uh, kind of consultation rights for third parties, which weren't there in the beginning. Um, and actually, that letter you mentioned, if it's the same one I'm thinking about, that we 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 led we led on writing that letter. Mm -hmm. um, but so I think you saw so a lot a lot bigger changes actually in yeah in in the European process compared to the UK, where what we have is very very close to what the government put out initially. Many thanks, Mark. So let us now look to the to the consultation document, uh, the, the guidance uh, paper, not one or two, but another one we have uh, in, uh, the, on, on how the CMA uh, is planning to enforce the new regime. And you have alluded already to this, uh, Sarah. So my first question to, to, to you, Lara, and maybe we can combine it with the next one. The first one uh, would, would concern rather this kind of continuous consult, uh, uh, need to consult with the stakeholders on every procedural step. If I count correctly, it's about 10 different uh, requirements in the in the pipeline to, to, to run public consultations, which somehow on one hand you understand that it increases um, transparency and allow, allows the public to participate, but it, how do we measure it? You, 
but it's it's probably good that we start with you, Lara, because you've been working at Ofcom, so you are you know how the enforcer, the the sectoral regulator, looks uh, at at public consultations, how you process this he, uh, eclectic to some degree information, mm -hmm. how you streamline them. I know yeah. I noticed that you in the latest consultations you offer much more structural uh, questionnaire. So that would be the first question. So agility and responsiveness of the new regime versus continuous requirement to double check it with the public almost kind of for box ticking purposes and the second one uh, is um, if if there is an opportunity to combine uh, is it better to do to do it as a procedural new start as a dma trying to distance itself from the legacy of exposed competition law or rather as a kind of continuation even even if autonomous continuation of competition regime uh, what are the pros and cons? I know these are two different questions, but maybe we can uh, look at them together. Yes, of course. I'll try to answer your first question about uh, the, the process around consultation. Now, every regulator has a duty to consult. And in my view, as a regulator, that is very, very important because it keeps the decisions maker accountable. It helps with transparency. It brings everybody to the same uh, level playing field in terms of the information that is being shared but more importantly it is a very key important way to make sure that the decision makers are able to check their approaches and amend them depending on the feedback that they have because let's not forget there is huge information asymmetries between a regulator and the players in a sector so that's a very very important step but you're right you can't take it too far and, and having consultation at each and every step can add to the process and basically have detrimental impact on agility. Now, if I look at the DMCC personally, what I would do if I were the CMA is to combine the designation and the conduct requirements in one consultation, because this is usually what happens in telecoms, in Ofcom. You know, we do an SMP market review assessment and remedy consultation in the same uh, in the same lot. The question is a little bit more difficult when it comes to pro-competitive interventions. Now, without going too much in detail, they are likely to be more complex to design and implement and probably more contentious as well. So there is merit in perhaps dealing with those separately because you want to get some quick wins. And in my view, doing a designation and a conduct requirement, relatively speaking to a PCI might be quicker and at least you get some rules and regulations in place and perhaps take your time to try and design PCIs. Now, on your second question in terms of the of the regime, is it a continuation on competition policy it's, and what are the pros and cons? To my view, at least what the DMCCA is, is about an ex ante regulatory framework, which means you try to understand the abilities and the incentives of the firms in the sector to behave anti-competitively and design your remedies such that the intervention is there before harms occurs. I mean, Sarah has already touched on this beforehand. So it's not so much continuation of competition policy, but obviously it's a regulatory framework, which at its heart wants to promote and then maintain effective competition in that sector. But there are differences. It's forward looking, it's dynamic. It will have a market power assessment, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll stop there because I don't want to take too much time from my other panelists. Thank you very much, Laura. Sarah? So I will, I'll start with the consultation and then you may have to cut me off on the second points because I've quite a lot to say on that. But just, just on yeah. the consultation, um, so, and I actually did a little table here <laughs> so that I could remind myself of where everything is. And so if you'll permit me, Olas, I'll just whiz through um, because I think it's quite interesting to just put into context sort of all the different points. So I've got, I had noted six very significant points at which the CMA, importantly, must carry out a public consultation. And the words of the Act say that they must. So you've got the proposed decision on SMS status, the imposition of a conduct requirement. Now, importantly, that, so that's section 24. You've also got revoking of a conduct requirement. Now that's the same section, but those are two separate consultations that would have two separate processes. The, the pro-competitive intervention decision that was talked about, the imposition of a pro-competition order, 
the revocation of a pro-competition order. So those are sort of six very significant points at which public engagement is sort of required to a certain extent. There's public consultation, which is required. And I think also there's, if you look in Schedule 1, there's two references, powers two and six, there's references then to commitments and varying commitments. Now, just I know there'll be a lot of students watching. If you word search publicly consult in the act, you're not going to come up into the section on commitments, because interestingly, in the in the act, it says that the CMA must uh, put out a notice and engage. But actually, it's when you go to the guidance that the CMA confirms that they've interpreted that as a public consultation. Now, on top of that, there are various points at which the CMA may consult. So compliance reporting, enforcement orders, varying, varying and re revoking enforcement orders. And then on top of that, you've got situations where, for example, um, there may be an invitation to comment. Now, I haven't actually gone through all of those in detail yet. That's on my list of my to-do list to identify all those different opportunities. So I think what that means in summary is that we've got an inordinate number of opportunities, as we had expected, for third party um, engagement, but of course, all within a statutory time frame. So we want we assume that they'll not be open for lengthy periods of time. And as Laura said, I expect that we will see conduct requirements and SMS designation being put together unless there's a good reason not to do that. Um, <clears throat> so what so the issues that we're kind of balancing here is that on the one hand, we, the criticism is that this is both time and resource intensive for both the CMA and the SMS firm, and of course, expensive for the latter, but that's obviously not a concern for the CMA. But the other hand, we know that um, engagement with stakeholders, third parties, suppliers, customers is, is a really essential way for the CMA to almost hold itself to account on a regular basis. And it means that decisions are sort of not gonna be taken in a vacuum but also the CMA will really value that evidence and information that's being provided in each of these consultations to ensure that their key tools are being used in the right way. So I think it is going to be ultimately a balancing between a huge opportunity, frankly, for the CMA to be able to constantly engage versus the need to be nimble and move things along quickly. On your second question, around sort of continuation, what we see that is the same and sort of different. I mean, I think these guidelines build on the CMA's considerable experience in various cases and market studies. So what I think is quite interesting is that um, there's, a there's a couple of points that really came out to me. So if, if we look at how the CMA will assess substantial and entrenched market power, so the first of the two SMS conditions, the other one being position of significance, the CMA clarifies that it's not required to carry out a formal market definition exercise, which, as they put it, sort of involves drawing arbitrary bright lines about kind of what products are in and out. So instead, they're going to focus on the kind of the competitive constraints applying to the potential SMS firm in respect of the digital activity. So substitutability, competitive rival, uh, rivalry, barriers to entry. Now, importantly, the CMA confirms that this approach is entirely consistent with the approach that it's taken in market studies under the Enterprise Act. So they reference online platforms, digital advertising market study and mobile ecosystems. So they're making clear that look, we are not departing from practice that we have already carried out. However, in paragraph 245 of the guidance, they state that substantial and entrenched market power is a distinct legal concept from that of dominance. Mm -hmm. And that I think reflects, um, and that this reflects, sorry, that the digital markets competition regime is a new framework with a different purpose. And therefore, importantly, the CMA will not typ typically, so they may, but may not typically, seek to draw on case law relating to the assessment of dominance when undertaking an SMS invest assessment, but they may have regard to underlying evidence and analysis from the CMA's existing investigations to the extent that the persistence of potential SMS firms market power is sort of relevant. Look, well, so what does this all mean? <laughs> well, I think we could summarize as substantial and entrenched market power is not dominance <laughs> and or certainly not dominance in the traditional legal concept. And the CMA is making clear that it will be charting a very new course in its assessment, but equally it will be referring to existing precedents. Now, of course, there's 
huge advantages and disadvantages to such an approach here. We always knew the new regime was going to introduce distinct legal concepts. But given that defining dominance was previously not without challenge, what we're now faced with is the introduction of another legal concept that's akin, but not the same. So the sister or maybe the cousin of dominance. And that, I think, is going to be subject to much debate, discussion and no doubt legal challenge. Oles, may I come in here? Yes, because. Um, from my point of view as a regulator, what the CMA is uh, setting out in, in, in the way that Sarah has very eloquently summarized is no different to what happens in other regulated sectors. And uh, it's the approach that uh, Ofcom takes in telecoms. You know, the SMP, the significant market power assessment is similarly very similar to dominance, but not quite dominance either. And it's, it's the bright line between export competition policy and ex ante regulatory framework. And obviously the CMA has to make that distinction because it's finding itself in a very a unique position of being an exposed competition authority as well as an, as an ex ante regulatory authority. Many thanks, Lara. Max, how do you see these two problems? Uh, well, I, I'll, so I'll start with the consultation question as well. I mean, as a civil society organization, we obviously really like transparency. We really like the ability to engage with these processes. And I think for, for us, it's not as straightforward, particularly with kind of traditional competition enforcement to engage with these processes because we're not uh you know a direct market participant in the way that you know businesses are um so i think having all these kind of abilities for a much wider set of third parties to engage including civil society organizations including academics like yourself uh, i think is really really positive um i think without that particularly because of how tailored the um CMA's powers are, I think there would be the risk that basically the regulatory process is uh, essentially kind of partially or fully captured by the SMS firms because they're the only ones who are really giving input to the CMA. They have deeper relationships, they have, you know, more resources to kind of give the CMA evidence and so on. So I think uh, counterbalancing that with these public consultation rights is really, really important. Um, but I think also more positively, there is you know, a huge range of different perspectives and expertise out there. Uh, and through this, I think the CMA can really draw on that and amplify, build, you know, amplify their own resources. Um, because even if they have 200 people in the digital markets unit, they're still taking on huge companies, again, that have, you know, a lot of people employed for them as well as external advisors. So uh, I think kind of being able to to, to draw on, on, on kind of expertise from outside is really, really helpful. Um, Yes, there is a risk that that basically also works like kind of grist in the mill of enforcement and and slows things down. I think that's just a trade off that, you know, you have to accept when you when you create these kind of rights. I'm I'm kind of comfortable with that. I think the CMA will also uh, find a happy balance in terms of, you know, how much time it spends going through these responses versus kind of taking decisions. Obviously, they have discretion on, 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 on you know, uh, how how to what level of depth they go through all these responses. So uh, I think they'll figure that out in the end. But but overall, I think it's very positive. Um, and then on the question around the regime and kind of comparing it to co competition policy, I think uh, Sarah put it really, really well. I mean, um, you know, overall, this is a, this is a pretty distinct legal regime. There are similarities, but again, you know, they're not using traditional market definitions. The concept of entrenched market power is quite different. Uh, again, they're not they're not relying on the traditional concept of dominance. So I think that all means it's something pretty, pretty different. Um, but where where I do think it will it, it has similarities is is the way that it's been informed by the experience of competition enforcement in digital markets. Uh, obviously. You know, if you look at the conduct requirements, uh, the permitted types, the principles, those are all clearly informed by a lot of the specific practices that the CMA has been investigating, uh, you know, self-preferencing and issues with app stores and tying and bundling and so on. So I think that is clearly based on on kind of uh, their enforcement experience and also the great market studies that they've done over the years into digital advertising, mobile ecosystems and so on. Um, and then there are more direct parallels, like, for example, if you look at the uh, pro competition interventions, the the concept of uh, you know adverse effect on competition is obviously kind of from the market investigation regime. The remedies that can be imposed through the pro competition orders are, I think you know basically identical to what can be done under market investigation. So there there is a there is a very direct formal link. Um, but I but I think yeah, it still it is something very very new, uh, and so we can't you know rely too much on past experience to kind of understand how the CMA will use the powers. Thank you very much, Max. So let us continue with this uh, 
spontaneously match practice of of of, of bundling two questions in in one. So uh, maybe let us move to this kind of uh, the the role of judicial uh, power in 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 this new regime. It can be very proactive. Uh, they they would be shaping the the parameters of the new regime as the courts usually do in the EU and the UK, and for right reasons, of course. So the the set of questions which I think is is important in this regard is. Um, First, how how much of the legacy of the past we want to be to be incorporated by the by, by the court uh, in interpreting different provisions or in 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 enforce or in adjudicating on specific cases um, with this guidance paper? How careful the CMA should be with uh, not putting itself into a trap as the Commission did with guidance on on one or two by essentially. Um, Paving the way for for the regime, which is kind of irrevocable, even if you change your mind, your mind knowing that it's not binding. Still, the legacy is there, and it's somehow you, the gin is out of bottle, so to say. So that would be an, an another another question. And the, the thing which I'm happy that I'm not alone being paranoid about this. I had the opportunity to discuss with with Marx on several occasions the provisions, the designation criteria of Section Five, which requires five year uh, forward looking assessment in order to designate an undertaking. In conjunction with conduct requirement, it may, Sarah, as you alluded, it makes much more sense to me. So you somehow you 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 tailor it towards specific obligations. But it, if you do it separately, is it just a kind of purely hypothetical scenario that an undertaking can challenge the very status of being designated in four and a half years time, showing how pathetically unrealistic the crystal ball gazing was four years ago, which is impossible obviously to predict. We know with merger control how difficult in much more stable market the situation is. And now with su such flexible markets with so much, uh, so many changes uh, happening all the time, the reality in four in a half years time will be different, of course. Is it purely hypothetical or even unrealistic sci-fi scenario, or is it quite plausible? <laughs> Set of questions, please please help yourself and choose whichever you want. Yeah. <laughs> May I start with your other with your uh, with two questions as a regulator? I feel quite um, happy to answer, and that's basically about issuing guidances and then um, what about forecasting the future now? It's very, very usual for regulators to issue guidance which sit alongside various rules and regulations. It's it's very, very typical, and it is one that I welcome. And there are a number of reasons why I welcome this, because first of all, it makes the rules quite accessible, especially for smaller firms. Because if you read the bill, oh my God, it is long, it's written <laughs> in a very legalistic way, et cetera, et cetera. A guidance, basically, it's a good way, a short way of uh, communicating to the public, to the lay person about what is the CMA's focus. And it's also a high level assessment about the processes and methodological approaches it will take. Secondly, a guidance is also, in my view, if it's drafted in an appropriate manner, complementary to the rules and regulations because it goes to the next level of detail. For example, Sarah has discussed this earlier, when it comes to substantial and entrenched market power, the CMA is talking about the type of factors it will take into account to assess when firms have substantial and entrenched market power. Now, putting all that detail in, in, a, in rules and regulations will make the act even more impenetrable in my view. So in, in essence, I think guidances are, um, are an, an important tool for the regulators and they are guidances, they are, news, they, are, they are rules and regulations and they are usually, they evolve over time and they need to evolve because as you get to know the sector you are regulating better, you need to have an option to actually change your processes with time because otherwise we have a very static and inflexible framework. But obviously there has to be some, um, some bounds to this. You know, it can't be boundless either because then what happens is that you create a lot of uncertainty for players in the, in the sector. Coming to your second question about uh, forward look approach. Again, as a regulator, we, we, we are very used to looking into the future because you start with the current situation when you do your market power analysis 
you understand the competitive constraints today, but you are regulating for the future. So it's very, very important to have that forward look. And the trick is the way in which regulators usually approach this challenging question, because as you said, Oles, how do you know what will happen in five years time when you don't even know what might happen next week? is to try and get evidence, data, and information from as many different sources as possible. You get it from the players, you get it from stakeholders, you get it from independent research organizations, you consult with the players, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also, it's not unusual. How do we, you know, this is what companies do on a day in day, day out basis. You know, they are commercial organizations who have their own strategic and commercial plans. And that is actually a very, very important input to the regulator's work. That's where you start and you sense check it with third party evidence and information as much as possible. And one last point is that should things materially change, and sometimes they do, some regulators have the option of reopening their market reviews. Now, you don't want to do that too often because it's not good precedent, but that option is there, for example, in the water sector or in the energy sector. Many thanks, Lara. Sarah, how do you see this? So I think on the guidance, I think Lara's answered that brilliantly. So I'll just make a couple of comments and say, I would go one step further and say the guidance is not just important, but essential. <laughs> so it's, and we would expect to see a development exactly as Lara said over time and updates and further guidance as and when it becomes clear and of course that's the great thing about guidance a regulator has got huge flexibility as to when it issues guidance if it thinks there's a demand to do so so I, I think that's I think that's something which um is you know what we would expect to see um I just sort of two minutes on or two you know a minute or so on uh, one of the areas that I think why it's really helpful is in relation to, for example, specifically the how, the when and the what for third parties interested in submitting complaints, because that we know that that's allowed for sort of within the act, but it wasn't really clear exactly how that would fit within the regime. So that's specifically dealt with as a section in uh, chapter six on monitoring. And it talks about where th third parties might wish to provide submissions or complaints, for example, on SMS compliance with competition requirements. And then there's also some really useful clarity on the specific questions which third parties may wish to provide comments or views on. And just as an example, that's the sort of area where guidance is really, really welcome because it provides a bit of a structure in a new regime for the, the the very important engagement from third parties to be able to provide something that's then helpful for the CMA to sort of take forward. I think on the five year sort of forward looking assessment, well, the rather obvious comment is a forward looking assessment for a period of five years, particularly in the realm of digital markets, I would say is not an easy task. Um, so the CMA's guidance focuses on sort of market developments and regulatory developments. But it's not the CMA is not going to enter in, into any crystal ball gazing or predictions about the likely development of the industry. I mean, that's pretty clear. So they'll consider instead of you know, whether these relevant developments, the market developments or regulatory developments are likely to be and I'm quoting sufficient in scope, timeliness and impact to emulate, eliminate the firm's substantial market power. But of course, the question is then going to be, and Lara's obviously touched on this, what evidence is the CMA going to rely on? And they refer to firms, internal documents, business forecasts, industry reports. But, you know, the, the, the main takeaway is there's a huge scope for the CMA to consider a range of um, quantitative and qualitative evidence. There's no set hierarchy. There's no quantitative thresholds for when SMS conditions are met. The CMA can use different approaches, which can vary across investigations, which we've already touched on. So they will welcome evidence of all and any sort in order to kind of make that assessment. Now, there's one, if you'll permit me, just something, this is more a sort of wider implication point. So as I was reading the guidance and looking back and forth, <clears throat> I was sort of thinking about this concept of potential competitor. And it, it, the, the, the CMA states in footnote 35, for anyone wants to have a look, that when assessing the likelihood that one undertaking will enter or significantly expand, the CMA will not necessarily conclude on the pre pre precise characteristics of the product or service level or sales it would achieve. Now, there's an, already an important distinction within established 
competition law on the on the difference between an actual and a potential competitor. So the CMA's guidelines on horizontal agreements confirms that undertakings are actual competitors if they're active on the same relevant product and geographic market, and potential competitors if there are real concrete possibilities that for undertakings to enter the market in question, they could kind of do so and compete with established undertakings. And what does real and concrete possibilities mean? Again, under the CMA's guidance, which refers to established case law, so this is the CMA's horizontal guidance, the entry would need to be within a short period of time, generally not more than three years. So both the CMA and EC guidance refer to three years. But here we have a situation where the CMA is considering potential market developments and new entrants, aka potential competitors, for up to a period of five years. Now, I'm not saying that these statements are incompatible because they're not, but it does raise this theoretical question of whether a new entrant that's a potential competitor for the purposes of the CMA's forward-looking assessment, because it may enter a market within four years, has a different status to a potential competitor who may enter a market within three years. And you know, the fact the CMA has given itself some flexibility on the precise characteristics of a market definition may lead to further questions around whether a company is a true potential competitor, sort of under the horizontal guidelines, or merely a likely new entrant, which perhaps has a different status. Now, this is not to, this, this is not meant to be a kind of techie criticism. I don't think there's incompatibility, but I'm I'm flagging the fact that there are interesting questions because how you advise from a compliance perspective about whether you think you know, someone is a potential competitor and whether they should therefore put in place, for example, information barriers when they are engaging in a vertical relationship with someone who they could potentially be in a horizontal relationship with, how do you then look at that assessment? I mean, absolutely fascinating, I'm not going to lie, you know, really exciting sort of issues to get to grips with. Um, some of these will end up being theoretical and not relevant, but some of these will end up being quite practical for those companies who are engaging in a in a web of vertical and horizontal relationships with lots of different entities within an ecosystem. Many thanks, Sarah. Max? Thanks, Alice. Well, you, you kind of gave my position away already, but, but as you say, um, I have never been a fan of this kind of forward-looking five-year assessment. I remember when I first read the legislation when it when it was published that was just one of the areas that stood out to me as a bit problematic and i think the main reason for that is when i think of the term entrenched for me that is not something forward looking it's something backward looking right you want to show that the power of a particular company has kind of persisted through time um and that was the approach for example taken under the dma right where you have to show that a firm has fulfilled the various kind of gatekeeper criteria over several years so i found it quite strange that that and i still find it strange that the test uh under the under the dmcc is is instead forward looking um I am concerned that I'm sure the CMA, you know, as Sarah was talking about some of the kind of criteria that they'll examine, I'm sure they'll do a kind of very rigorous job at examining that. But I am concerned about some of the opportunities that it gives the SMS firms to kind of put forward very speculative arguments about how uh, in a particular area of the digital economy, actually, their dominance is under threat. Um, you know, just think about generative AI, for example, and the way that, I mean, I think now people are a bit less worried about that, but earlier there were all sorts of claims about how Google was going to see its market share sort of eroded by Microsoft in search because of generative AI. Uh, you know, you've heard Meta often, especially in the US, uh, point to TikTok as a reason for why they don't need to be kind of uh, subject to more antitrust enforcement and so on. So, so I'm a little bit worried about the opening that creates for those kind of arguments. Um, so, you know, during the legislative process, we were we were arguing for a shift to a backward looking test. Obviously, that that, that wasn't. Max, Max, sorry. Do you think these uh, these decisions are justiciable? Do do they think they they, they can challenge this the, the designation status? I mean, I think they will try. I think it. I think it wouldn't be easy um, because I think it would just be generally very hard to come up with kind of substantial evidence to actually show that their kind of empirically measurable entrenched power in the present is going to be eroded away in the future. So I don't think it would be easy. But I think even if they're able to kind of waste time and waste enforcers' resources in putting forward those claims, and I think that's that's already uh, not a good thing. Um, but yeah, so that's that's my view on 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 that. Um, and then I think just on the on the guidance point, uh, 
very quickly um, because others have responded to that really well. Uh, I think similar to my response to your question about the consultations, you know, for, for us, the more transparency, the better. Um, and I think it's it's impressive how quickly the, the CMA has put out such a kind of high quality, detailed, thoughtful document on how it plans how it plans to use the new powers that I think answer a lot of questions that were not necessarily obvious from reading through the legislation itself. Um, and I think I'm not too worried about them being kind of tied down by it because I think actually they're very careful throughout the guidance to not uh, restrict their room for maneuver. You know, they say often, well, we're not going to give this type of evidence more weight than others. We'll look at quantitative, qualitative. Uh, this is just, you know, some examples of what we'll be looking at. It's not exhaustive. Uh, so I think they, they'll have a lot of room anyways. And I, even if you look at how the guidance is described in the DMCC legislation, uh, you know, there, there isn't language about how the CMA has to give kind of uh, has to rely on the guidance when making decisions. It just says they have to produce guidance. Um, so I think they'll be free to diverge from it if they need to. They can update it whenever they need to. So I, I think the guidance is is very much a positive. Okay, thank you very much. I'm mindful of time. So I propose we continue with, with putting together questions. So the, 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 the first block out of the remaining two uh, concerns pro, the, the mechanism of pro-competition interventions. So we see that we have somehow uh, two potential. Uh, I remember in one of the iterations of the D, uh, of the DMCC bill, the idea, conceptual idea, was to have the to have it sequential, starting with uh, conduct requirements, and then if things don't work as they should, then the CMA could uh, uh, launch at that time called pro, -com pro competitive intervention as pro competition. What what is your reading behind this uh, architecture of two procedural uh, alternatives, which the CMA has? One, uh, the first one, the, the 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 conduct requirements. We have mandatory efficiency in terms of ma mandatory in the sense that the, the CMA must take into consideration or must accept representations made by the 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 the, the companies why they don't co comply with conduct requirements. The second one, it, it appears to be more optional, so you have flexibility to say, okay, we accept them or not. Um, what is your reading behind the, the regulatory wisdom offering to the CMA two alternative, essentially, paths towards enforcing the new regime? Is it uh, a prudent strategy or it's kind of duplication? And what's the rationale behind it? So maybe it's the first, the first block of question. Lara? Yes, thank you. Um, as a regulator, as an economist, I obviously have a, a slightly different perspective on this. In my view, conduct requirements and pro-competitive interventions deal with different issues in digital markets. Now, conduct requirements, it's all about dealing directly with the exploitation of uh, customers or consumers. It is about the CMA telling the firms with SMS do something or don't do something. If you look at pro-competitive interventions, those are the type of interventions where the CMA will try to address the root cause of the market power itself. So if you want to encourage markets which maintain effective competition, ultimately you will achieve that through pro-competitive interventions, not conduct requirements. Conduct requirements, it's a quick win telling the firms do something which is because it's good, you know, be transparent, deal with them fairly or don't do something. Now, pro-competitive interventions, having kind of designed them in, in Ofcom and at the CMA, they are quite complex and they require a lot of qualitative and quantitative evidence to make sure you design them appropriately. You know, if you look at the types that the CMA can go with, it could be behavioral, interventions in the form of a price control or licensing regime or structural whereby it might require companies to divest or even separate. So they are dealing with fundamentally different things. And, uh, and, and in my view, PCIs are really required if you want to change the way in which digital markets are operating. Lovely. Many thanks indeed, Laura. Sarah? I mean, I think that's a brilliant answer from Lara, so I'm not intending to kind of add too much other than to say almost it's it's almost as if the, the the conduct requirements are a bit more, I don't want to say this, but superficial. You know, they come in, there's something that I say easily, quite quickly, it's evident that there will be an action that could change a sort of situation. 
I think the best way to look at PCIs is for those of us that have been through a number of market investigations, that really is under the car bonnet of a market that is really engaging in the substance and the detail to look at these sort of longer term dynamic changes, which almost are sort of more forward looking. And again, there we say it's sort of future proofing, but require a, a real assessment of whether there is um, an AEC. Now, the only thing I would say is, I mean, look, understanding the interaction between these tools is going to be a really fundamental part of the regime. And I think what's going to be interesting is when, because of the fact that there's an opportunity to engage in the CR process, because there's a mandatory consultation, what I think is going to be interesting is the fact that there will be, there's of course going to be similarities between the sort of um requirements that third parties and industry participants ask for and an overlap potentially between the submissions frankly that are going in in relation to conduct requirements and pci so what will be really interesting to see is how in practice those two tools sort of are separated out so that um, there's kind of clarity as to what SMS firms should be fighting on <laughs> in the first stage and the second stage, and in the same in the same vein, what sort of third parties should be requesting um, strategically at each stage. Many thanks to you, Sarah. Mark, so I'll try not to repeat too much what uh, Sarah and 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 Lara have said, um, but I completely agree about about PCIs. I think they're the part of the legislation that I'm probably excited about the most. Um, because if you, if you go back to uh, you know the initial question you asked, and I was talking about how I want this legislation to not just uh, you know prevent bad behavior or prevent these firms from abusing their power, but I actually want to see it kind of try and actually tackle the root causes of concentration, try and open up digital markets. I think the PCIs uh, have much more potential in that sense. Um, you know, I think the the conduct requirements are quite similar to the. They're very similar to the do's and don'ts that you have in the DMA, um, whereas I think the PCIs, I mean, they're, they're pretty much unlimited in the types of remedies the CMA can impose. And I think they're, you know, particularly going beyond beyond behavioral obligations and having things like interoperability or even even divestments where necessary, I think could really uh, actually kind of make some big, big positive changes in, in digital markets. Um, so I think that's very positive. Um, I think one concern I have is that the CMA um, will kind of be hesitant to use them in the beginning. And I, they don't say this in the guidance, but I get the sense just from kind of listening to them that they see the CRs as what they want to focus on first. And then if they're not able to solve the problem, then maybe they'll go for PCIs. Whereas what I would like to see is actually where they use the two in parallel very much from the outset. So in some cases, you know, as Lara was saying, if they need a quick fix to stop some kind of problematic behavior, they issue a CR. But I think if it's obvious from the beginning that some sort of more uh, sweeping remedy that you can only do through a PCI is the best way to go, then I would want them to kind of start that process immediately instead of trying to fix it with a conduct requirement and maybe an enforcement order and then only getting to the PCIs after a, a long amount of time. Um, but but yeah, I think I, I'm very glad that they were included in the legislation. Thank you, Mark. May I, may <laughs> I just perhaps uh, give a little bit of a... I think both Max and Sarah have uh, kind of uh, touched on a very important issue there in relation to PCIs. Will they have the courage to use them? Let's take Amazon, for example, which is vertically integrated. And we know that one of the biggest issues is self-preferencing their own retail um, over and above third parties. Now, will the CMA have the courage to functionally separate them or even uh, structurally break them up? Probably not. It's very, very contentious remedy. But if you look at telecoms, the threat of um, an Enterprise Act investigation on BT actually was quite a disciplining factor. I would say up to a certain level, it didn't sort out all of the issues, but having that stick was really helpful. The question is, if people know you will never use that stick, it's really not a stick. That's I mean, sorry, so just... Just, I, I'm sorry, I know you're going to come in, but just to respond to that that quickly, I think that brings us, you know, we've been having quite a technical discussion first focused on the regulation here, but I think that question of what kind of remedies the CMA will be prepared to use brings in broader questions around politics, around the, the size of the UK market, its ability to actually 
credibly impose certain things on these on these companies. I think you know the the drama we saw about the Microsoft Activision merger was a good example of potentially what happens when the CMA tries to go too far and that creates, for example, political backlash. Um, so it'll be interesting to see all, all how, how how this plays out, particularly with probably a Labour government in power who may have a different approach to these types of tools. Um, so all, you know, all very speculative, but I think those are the some of the considerations we'll have to think about as well as as this all comes into effect. And just okay, so let us. Sorry, you want to sorry I think Sarah wanted to. So this is obviously an area that we all have quite a few views on. Just two <laughs> very very brief comments. So I think first. Just picking up on something Max said, sort of just maybe think it would be interesting to see if if at the point where there is a public consultation on the SMS designation, so right at the beginning, will we see third parties going in, sort of saying, here is our proposal for the way in which you know um, CRs, but maybe even PCIs could be um, deployed by the CMA. So obviously they can't consider. What PCIs would take would be in, in, in force until or in, introduced until they've gone through an investigation. But there's nothing to stop third parties pulling together articulate submissions on what can happen, particularly following cases that have already happened. So might we see sort of lots of early stage evidence gathering and building in particular markets at that SMS designation stage, which the CMA could then take into consideration to kind of almost get out front. And then the second point is just thinking about sort of um, structural separation over spill. So where you're uh, frankly sort of advising a company that's not SMS designated, but where they operate perhaps in a similar area and then you're watching these, let's say that the CMA does go for some sort of really, um, uh, it, frankly, intrusive structural separation remedy, you know, that you can't ignore that. You can't then advise your clients that these things aren't happening. So then again, of course, whether a company agrees to do it will completely depend on their risk appetite. But if you had a company that had a very low antitrust risk appetite and you saw some sort of structural separation happening, you would then, you might end up sort of saying, well, look, frankly, our advice to the board is that if you want to be absolutely safe about this in the way that you're introducing this new particular business model, we can look to examples where the CMA has gone in in these sorts of markets. And so then you'd have this sort of potential potential regulatory overspill. I mean, I'm sure the CMA would absolutely love that because obviously it saves them sort of having to go through the process. But just to flag some of the many, many implications that kind of come out as we start unpacking all of this. Amazing. Uh, let me put forward a few questions which we have uh, uh, still in the pipeline and please help us out and pick the, those which are of most relevance in your in your view. The first one is a kind of follow, uh, a follow up question about how different the pro competition intervention regime is to the current market investigation mechanism. Is it just incremental refinement to what we already have? Or it allows the CMA greater competences and in a, in a more speedy, speedy and more inter. Or the, the the toolbox is wide and more diverse. The second question concerns uh, the the mechanism of final offer. Many people discuss how immeasurable these front terms are, and maybe uh, going to a kind of more arbitration mechanism would would facilitate at least some second best uh, option in terms of. Finally, defining the price for for issues for, for access issues where price is necessary component, and the third one, um, I remember how when we when the DMA emerged, we were talking about DMA DSA as if they were two sister regimes. Then we forget about DSA; it's completely different cluster. In the DMCCA, we still have even more strange situation that part one part of the bill. Uh, digital markets lives its autonomous life, but there is also another part, a larger one, on consumers, consumer law, with potentially enormous implications for at least for law industry of uh, practicing uh, law, uh, law and third party, let's say, funded uh, litigate litigation industry as well. So maybe ref to reflect or maybe to elucidate something on on this untouched, uh, at least in our competition bubble uh, cluster uh, area of DMCCA. And uh, so, uh, or maybe you wanted to reflect on something which has not been mentioned and you, you still in conjunction with the topics which we have discussed, it's, it, it was mentioned uh, as a last kind of round. Lara, please. Yes. 
Let me pick on friend because that's my uh, kind of <laughs> preferred topic. Um, as a regulator, I have been in many positions where we issued or imposed a fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory obligation. Usually regulators go down that route because ideally they would like parties to commercially negotiate a mutually beneficial uh, agreement amongst themselves and or they don't have the data to be able to come out with it. But you need, but what happens is that, especially in the telecom sector, experience has shown that you find yourself having to give a lot of guidance about what you would consider to be fair and reasonable, because what's fair and reasonable to you may not be fair and reasonable to the other party. And eventually, actually, even that guidance is not enough, and you start intervening to actually and the fair and reasonable price in this context is five pounds. So my concern is that putting a friend obligation may be like kicking the can down the road and i would very much hope especially given the incentive of certain parties in this sector to try and uh, kind of game the the, the 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 potential remedy options to try and actually be quite bold and say you know what i am going to go for the final offer and if that don't what doesn't work actually i'm going to set the price so i'm kind of quite I, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from other sectors that the cma should look into when it comes to that particular um, question um so on your fourth question, for me, the DMCC is very similar to market investigation with the benefit that the process is shorter in terms of statutory timetable. And uh, on your last question, I will just briefly say it's great that the CMA will have greater penalty powers on consumers because, again, it's a great way to keep people and players accountable, but also shortcut a very long process of having to go to court to try and find players, et cetera, et cetera. Sarah, excuse me. I, I wanted to ask a, a, a quick follow-up question, uh, Lara, on this opportunity. You've been working at, at Ofcom for quite a long time. What is the kind of institutional, I know it's changing within the Digital, uh, Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum, but overall, can you give us a flavor, the cooperation between Ofcom and CMA, uh, how important it is, how well adjusted this mech, these coupling points are, and maybe some information on this regard, just as a, as, as to, to, to highlight the discussion. Of course, I mean, the first thing I would say is um, in, the, in the CMA, in the digital markets units, there are a lot of uh, people with experience of telecoms regulation and also with experience of having worked in Ofcom beforehand. So that institutional experience and expertise is already transferred to the DMU, which in my view, it's, it, it's very helpful. And uh, having observed, I think there is very close collaboration between regulators in the UK. I think it's one of the positive things of the regime. Where, and that was there well before the DRCF came into power, because there is a lot of memoranda of understanding that the CMA itself has signed with other regulators when it comes to enforcing competition powers, because it's uh, they've got parallel powers in that area. And uh, as a, having been in the CMA, having been at Ofcom as, as a third party observer, I think this uh, cooperation works well, but ultimately you can only have one chief. And obviously when it comes to DME or CMA related decisions, they are in the lead, but they are very good at uh, collaborating with their peers in the UK. And also internationally, I would say there is a very strong collaboration through the um, what was it? The ICN, isn't it? The International Competition Network on these issues. But ultimately, the CMA has always made it clear that they need because they have to take into account the requirements of consumers and citizens in the UK. Lovely. Thank you very much, Lara. Sarah? So I, I'll focus my sort of slot on consumer law, I think, because this is, I mean, this really is sort of the elephant in the room in terms of the competition law bubble. Because actually the consumer is, you know, absolutely center stage. I mean, the clue is in the title of the act, but the focus on consumers is just, it's not to be underestimated. So the sections on enforcement of consumer protection law, consumer rights and disputes run from clauses 147 to 310. So it's sort of practically half the bill and all airspace, time, discussions and debates have been about 
gatekeepers and platforms in the lead up to this bill. I mean, there's been a little bit more, so I'd say in the last, um, sort of in the, in the last few months actually, but competition policy is after all, you know, focus on the concept of consumer welfare and, and this consumer protection focus is, is absolutely core to this um, uh, act. And the significant change is that the CMA is going to have, as Laura said, direct administrative enforcement powers to bring consumer cases rather than having to take a business to court, which is time consuming and expensive. And the CMA will be able to impose significant fines up to 10% of global turnover for the first time. Now, what I thought I'd do just, just so that so we've captured it, I mean, under the Act, the CMA is going to be able to, to directly enforce an extensive set of consumer rules. So I'll just do a kind of flavour of what that looks like. There are existing broad prohibitions on unfair contract terms in consumer contracts and unfair commercial practices, which include um, misleading <coughs> consumers, acting aggressively or contravening requirements of professional diligence. But then there are new rules which have been introduced, which is sort of following the decisional practice before the courts. So subscription contracts, for example, which automatically renew for indefinite or fixed periods, they're going to be subject to specific rules, including providing specific types of information, issuing reminder notices and allowing customers to exit in a sort of straightforward way. Um, drip pricing, so um, the sort of the invitation to purchase must set out the total price of a product, so that includes any fees, taxes, charges, and other payments. So this is to reduce sort of the, the low headline rates that in reality are much more expensive when you've kind of gone through the whole process. Fake reviews, so these are sort of officially banned and, and, and interestingly not taking reasonable or proportionate steps to prevent publication or removal of such reviews is also included. And then secondary ticketing, which I kind of mentioned earlier. So this was an issue which held up passage of the bill in May. Um, so the concerns there are around providers selling event tickets at significant markups. And I can only imagine what Taylor Swift tickets are going for at the moment. So the House of Lords had put forward some specific provisions on secondary ticketing, but the House of Commons instead put forward enforcement of existing rules on ticket sales, which were then passed. So what does all this mean? Well, look, there are significant implications for businesses that are consumer facing. And that is really important because many of those companies need to be looking at their practices very carefully. And many of those companies probably don't have sort of compliance regimes in place for consumer regulation policy law. That just probably isn't something that's necessarily on their radar. I think making a prediction, I think we will see a couple of very significant cases that come out. And that will be the proverbial cup of cold water, glass of cold water in the face of everyone going, oh, right, <laughs> we really need to focus on this then. Um, many competition lawyers don't have experience in consumer law. That's a statement of fact. It is not something that appears at lots of kind of competition conferences. And, and I think sort of preempting sort of one of the questions we often have at the end, which is what should students kind of be doing and thinking about, you've got to get your head around consumer law. I mean, really, <laughs> that is really something that, that in order to have a good broad practice, you know, it's something that we will all be doing. And it's something that is going to be very, very relevant to those of our clients that are consumer facing. I will, if you permit me, just do a minute, <laughs> one minute on merger control, because I mean, that's obviously a core area of my practice and there's some some changes to the UK's existing competition regime which importantly apply outside of digital markets so there are some you know you need to dig around in there but there are some things that you can't completely ignore this if you don't work in digital markets so there's a new no increment share of supply jurisdiction for any global deal where only one party has significant UK precedent so this is sort of designed to catch killer acquisitions which okay admittedly is more likely to be the case in digital markets, but it doesn't it doesn't explicitly apply to digital markets, and that is um, that means that the jurisdiction can be established where at least one merging business has one an existing share of so existing share of supply of thirty three percent in the UK, so no need for the increment, and the UK turnover of at least three hundred and fifty million, provided the target has got UK nexus. Turnover thresholds are raised from from existing currently seventy million to one hundred million in line with inflation. 
there's a new safe harbour for mergers which will be exempt from review where each party's turnover is less than 10 million. And there are some procedural changes in relation to phase two, which I won't go into, but I just wanted to make sure that that was captured. Thank you very much, Sarah. And, and the follow-on question quick, but by the way, there will be still questions or uh, recommendations of students. So you should think while Max will be answering his bit about another recommendation. <laughs> but you you as a practicing lawyer, what do you feel? What's the what do you sense? What's the atmosphere among your among among your colleagues? Uh, are they excited with this uh, new regime? Um, I would use two words, excited, and then when you open up the guidance and the bill together, overwhelmed, because there is there is a lot to get through. Um, I, so I, sort of admitting to my age, but I was a student with Richard Bush um, back when the Enterprise Act was a bill, and I remember him coming into the classroom with sort of pages and pages, and we'd work through it. And there was this energy and excitement because nothing's more exciting for a lawyer than a new act, right? I mean, <laughs> because then you've got the opportunity to get through devil of the detail, but then lay on top of that as a practitioner, how are you then going to translate that to advising your clients, which is why the guidance is not just important, but essential. Um, I think, you know, there are many of us that, particularly those of us that work in digital markets, I think there is a sense of also relief for certain clients who have really struggled to get what they need under the previous regime, excitement about how we can use the tools that are there to kind of help clients do certain things, and also excitement because there's a great unknown, which can be difficult and challenging for legal certainty and can be difficult when you're kind of advising clients, but we will just be pouring upon everything that kind of comes out to try and um, learn as much as we can and um you know we'll expect to see challenges and blocks along the way but i think i think it is a very a very exciting time thank you very much Sarah. max great well lots lots to cover i'll try and touch on your different questions in, in turn some in more details than others um on the question about pcis versus market investigations i mean as i talked about earlier uh I, you know, they are pretty similar and specifically as the guidance says you know the remedies are basically the same as the ones that can be imposed in market investigations the key difference as Lara mentioned is the timeline right 18 months for market investigation whereas pci nine months um and the the other the other advantage obviously is i think the cma isn't having to do all of the groundwork it does in a market investigation in terms of gathering information it will have done a lot of that already through the studies it's already done through the sms designations and so on so i think it, it will just be able to move faster um, I think that does raise an interesting question, actually, of why the CMA hasn't launched more market investigations into digital markets in the past, instead of waiting for the for this legislation. If actually the PCIs are kind of a pretty similar power, um, I think it was was Tom Smith who who made that point in in one of his blogs recently. Um, on the kind of FRAND final offer mechanism question, I mean, I see the final offer mechanism as essentially very similar to the news media bargaining codes that we've seen introduced in lots of other places uh, like Australia, like Canada, or the copyright uh, directive provisions on kind of publisher neighboring rights. Um, it, it, CMA has gone for a kind of interesting system, though, in that instead of that mechanism coming into effect, immediately there's a kind of whole series of things that has to happen before you get there. So you first first need to have a conduct requirement where you know the cma requires uh the sms firm to kind of you know uh, basically reach terms on fair pricing with third parties you know i think we're often thinking of publishers but it isn't limited to that in the legislation uh and then if that doesn't work out then you know that the, the cma can intervene with a with a, a you know a, a investigation of a breach and then there can be an enforcement order and only after you've gone through all of that do we get to the imposition of this final offer mechanism where you know the cma essentially is presented with suggested payment terms from the SMS firm and from the third parties. And then it kind of picks whichever one it thinks it's fairer. So I think overall, that's not a, it's not a bad system in terms of how it's designed to kind of start with more voluntary, um, you know, negotiations and then, and then only have this more mandatory coercive system. If that doesn't work, I think where some people have concerns, particularly the publishers is how long it could take to get there. Mm -hmm. If you have to go through the CR and the breach and the enforcement order and the breach of enforcement order to get to the final offer mechanism that could take a number of years. And whereas I think a lot of these concerns about fair payment from you know, big tech firms to publishers are very live right now, especially with generative AI, 
and the use of that content. So there's a question of whether this will basically be to take too long to actually have it have an effect. Um, but I, I think we'll just have to see how it pans out. Um, on the consumer solar, consumer law side of things, I don't have much to add to what's been said. I followed that less closely. I mean, to me, it's a bit of a no-brainer to give the CMA the, the power to enforce consumer law directly instead of having to go through the courts. I think things like fake reviews, subscription traps, drip pricing, I mean, those seem to me very obviously negative things. Um, so if we can kind of stamp them out through legislation, then why not? Um, and actually, the, the point of the, the part of the legislation that was that I was going to point out that's outside of the digital markets regime, uh, Sarah already mentioned, but I, I think the merger, specifically the new kind of thresholds um, around, uh, well, as she as she mentioned, essentially, if the acquirer is large enough in terms of its kind of turnover and, and, and share of the market, then that is enough for the CMA to investigate, regardless of how small the target is. Uh, I think that's really significant. I think it's a positive thing because I think there is a need to have uh some sort of formal way to basically intervene in you know small small low value deals um at least in terms of turnover but that are potentially eliminating a, a future competitor or giving a a dominant firm access to kind of very uh, let's say cutting edge technology that they could use to reinforce their market power and i i think we've seen some of the kind of issues that the EU has faced in trying to deal with that without without actually changing the merger regulation, you know, the whole issue around Article 22 and whether that's going to be shut down by the courts and so on. So I think now at least the CMA doesn't need to worry about that. They have a kind of formal ability to, to do so. Um, and then actually one last point, which is related to something Sarah said around uh, cons consumers. Uh, I would I would slightly challenge that in that I certainly agree that consumers are a, a major kind of beneficiary of these new powers, and certainly the CMA should have them in mind. But I would also want the CMA to think about harms that can be caused by concentration in digital markets that don't necessarily have a direct or even indirect impact on consumers. You know, I think there are cases, for example, where a large firm, because of its monopsony power over suppliers, can cause harms to those suppliers without necessarily benefiting consumers. I mean, that could actually lead to lower prices for consumers, but I think we should care about harms to, for example, small businesses and suppliers intrinsically. Um, and then there are other questions around, for example, media, media plurality, you know, the concentration that we see in digital advertising has had impacts on uh, the ability of publishers to sustain themselves financially. And that's not necessarily a consumer harm, it's more about harm to media plurality, the information that we receive and so on. Um, questions around, what does it mean for our economic resilience if we're all dependent on a couple of cloud hyperscalers, things like that. So I think um, while they should definitely look into consumer benefit, I think they shouldn't, you know, there are harms that I think aren't captured by that. So that's just a, a final point. Amazing. I think the, the privilege uh, of, of inviting knowledgeable and interesting people is that you end conversation being more curious and more excited and more inspirational than the, you started with. So thank you very much for this great conversation, but we shouldn't forget about our tradition and offering recommendations to students, maybe not necessarily on the topic, maybe on some learning skills or something. How do you deal with this cacophony of fragmented pieces of information, avalanche of information, something which you find would, would you consider useful as a student to know uh, back, back then? Lara, let's start with you. Indeed, and you, you you said something very important on this. There will be a lot of noise around from very different jurisdictions, one, and there will be a tsunami of kind of data, information, decisions coming in due course. My suggestion would be as an empirical um, practitioner, as well as knowing the law, it's very important to actually understand what's happening on the ground. And there are various ways in which students can achieve that. Go to conferences, talk to people. As decisions come out, look at how uh, decisions makers have gone about implementing the rules and regulations. And again, reach out to them and talk to them. I think what's important will be how you put into practice everything that it's written in black and white on paper. Thank you, Lara. Sarah? I think too for me, my first one, which really builds on what Lara said is understand business models. So don't just think about the law. And I, when I say apply it, I don't mean to apply it, but I mean, read widely read the Financial Times, read The Economist, read, uh, read anything that sort of analyzes how different business models work so that you can understand the complexity of some of these um, ecosystems because you 
will always have to overlay the law and get up to speed very, very quickly on what a business is doing if you're going down the advisor route. And the ability to understand how an industry works very quickly is, is an essential skill. The second, which is something I think is a real shame, we just don't see it as much because there's frankly not the opportunity, but it's networking. Start your networking now. You know, when I was a younger lawyer, there were far more conferences around, in-person conferences, and that was really, really valuable, not just in terms of knowledge, but in terms of meeting people. And when you go to a conference, always ask a question. Very small. Thank you very much, Sarah. <laughs> Max? I think firstly, just to say, I think this is such an interesting time to be working on on competition policy and specifically on, on digital markets. I mean, I think, you know, we've had these big pieces of legislation passing like the DMCCA, like the, like the DMA, but really it's just the beginning of the process. I mean, it might seem like job done, but actually enforcing these things is the real, real challenge. And so I think it's going to be fascinating intellectually to follow that. I think there's going to be a lot of work for people to do. So, yeah, that's more of a, an, an observation. Um, I completely agree with Sarah about the need to really delve into business models as, as opposed to just kind of thinking about the legal framework. I think that's extremely important, particularly in technology where things are evolving so fast. I think, you know, if you want to follow what's happening with generative AI and how that's interacting with all these existing models, I mean, you, you need to be following the news kind of day by day, for example. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I worked for a couple of years uh, for a political risk consultancy advising tech companies on tech regulation. Uh, and, you know, that was just gave me super useful insights on actually how these companies operate on the inside, how they think about regulation, how they interact with policymakers. So for me, that's been very valuable as well in the work that I do at Open Markets. Um, I also think it's important not to just be in this kind of competition silo or competition bubble. I think um, Sarah talked about the need to understand consumer law, but I think that applies to data protection. I think it applies to all kinds of tech regulation that we're seeing in, in content moderation rules. And even more broadly, things like industrial policy, for example, are now are increasingly kind of interacting with competition policy. So I think you have to think of these things in the round. Um, and I think that's an approach that governments and regulators are increasingly taking this idea of this whole of government approach. Um, and then I think last point is just, you know, yeah, when when your students, when they're thinking about what they want to do with their knowledge, you know, don't forget that civil society is also increasingly a, a route for using your competition knowledge. I mean, obviously, you have the private sector, you have competition authorities, you have academia, but I think there are more and more think tanks, NGOs who are realizing how important these issues are, who are that are interested in the structure of markets, corporate power. And so uh, I think, you know, we, we, we also need that kind of expertise in, in civil society as well. So that's just a uh, little encouragement there. Thank you very much, Max. Lara Dimitrova Stoimanova, Sarah Long, Max Buntun, thank you very much for this really fascinating and insightful conversation. It was really a pleasure. Thank you for inviting us. Thank, thank you. you, Alice.